Hosting for the Dice Tower is generously provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, episode 485. Please play the game I want to play. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Jeff wonders if clarity in rules is all it's cracked up to be. Brian makes a classic out of Race for the Galaxy, and Mike asks if it can be fun to lose. Plus, Tom and I played a bunch of games together for once. We have a tale of awkwardness, some questions from the mailbag, and we discuss methods of recruiting players for a game nobody else wants to play. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Landley, Lyle Landley, of board gaming, Tom Vassell. King of the obscure references. Now, before you yell at me, I know what, who that is, because... Monorail. Monorail. Because I actually went out of Monorail. the way to, to look it up before Monorail. we recorded this show, but... You know who wrote that song, right? What song? That, okay, so there's the monorail song that Lyle Lanley sings on the Simpsons episode. Dude, this is super obscure now. I can understand that this is not a Simpson character everyone knows. They should. How many episodes was he in? One? One. How many episodes? One of, amazing episode. How many episodes of the Simpsons are there? I don't, I don't know, I but it's over there's one amazing point. episode. This Conan O'Brien wrote that one. The Simpsons have more episodes than we do. Yeah, it's true. Uh, anyway, Lyle Landley was an awesome salesman. He was drawing people in for his idea. So you drawing people in to play your game. It works. I think I probably saw that episode. But anyway. All this criticism. I'm not criticizing. <laughs> yes, you are. Man, I'm the one that gets criticized because I don't know your stuff. I actually knew this one because I looked it up. Oh, good. I looked it up, though. All right. Anyway, folks, welcome to Dice Tower. I'm Tom Vassell. Hi there. I'm Eric Summerer. And it is almost the end of 2016. I believe this is the first episode of December. So, oh, my goodness. How did this happen? I'm kind of – this is kind of a weird time of year for me because if you have a family, which Eric and I both do, mm-hmm. Decembers get filled up. Why? Because every school in the world decides to do a Christmas program. And yeah. churches do Christmas programs, and relatives want to see you, and all kinds of events happen. And because we 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 don't dare rest in December, fortunately, <laughs> there's very few conventions except the Dice Tower Cruise, which yeah, should, the floating convention that should hopefully not be too stressful of a convention. <laughs> I'm not expecting stress. It's the travel. Yeah, but even the travel. I mean, you're essentially getting on a plane, right? And then yeah. we'll we'll handle the rest. It's a boat. It's a boat. It's not so bad. I don't know. Jason might leave me at the airport. He might forget. No. If there's one thing Jason doesn't forget is people at the airport. That's for sure. Oh, good. Oh, good. Uh, but anywho, so that's coming up. But, you know, we're also preparing. Well, we're going to start talking about this now. I hate I, – I don't wish to talk about it all year round. But, folks, we do have a fundraising effort that we will be running in January. So pay attention. We will be giving more about that coming up. But there will be promos galore. But also – a. Hopefully not just promos in the sense that we hope that you – if you found our stuff useful over the course of this year, that you will support our show come 2017. Otherwise, Eric is gone. Yeah. They're going to cut me. No, we're not going to cut him. But we do have a contest for our episode 500, which is coming in 15 episodes. So That's, that's what's going to cut me. <laughs> no. But if you want to find out details of that episode, I'm deciding only to talk about them in even-numbered episodes. So you can listen to the last episode or next episode, whatever. Um, although our next episode, I'm not sure what we're doing. I think our next episode is going to be live. We'll see. I think on the boat is what we're planning. You'll hear the first seasick episode. Eric will be like, <laughs> Bring some drama in with you, Eric. You never know. Gr- great. No, 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 no. It's just a precautionary thing, I think. You know, you probably won't get seasick, but why not be prepared? I guess. Be prepared. Now Disney will sue us. All right. Yes. So 
last episode, we talked about Board Game Geek Con and how Eric and I went there, and we actually played games together. We did. So I wrote four games that we played together here. I think we may have played more than this, but we definitely played these four. Yes. We attempted to play, what was that game called? Mars? We tried to play Martians, A Story of Civilization, and you just got more and more upset with the rule book, and we eventually put it back in the box because we, we couldn't figure it out. I have a copy of this that I'm still trying to work my way through. Um that I've, that I've borrowed from a, a listener. He, he had me pick it up at Essent, and I, I get to play it first before I give it to him, which is amazing. Um, but I, we haven't figured oh, out how oh, to play it yet. That was for a listener. I thought that was for you. No. So you would not have got that game otherwise? No. Oh, I was trying to figure out why you got it. I mean, it looks interesting. Man, it looks... But it was not on my radar until he asked me to pick it up for him. Well, the problem we have is the rules first say, hey, there's four ways to play this game. Solo, cooperative, semi-cooperative, or competitively. And right. then doesn't bother to tell us which one we should play first, so we're not sure. Yeah, which, which one's the real way to play. And then the rules, it'll say, step one, uh, do this, this, and this. Oh, if you're playing competitively, do this and this. And if you're playing solo, do this and this. And like, well, No, tell us... Tell us how to play the game and then give us a variant in the back of the rule book. It was, it, it was virtually incomprehensible. I hear they're making Sad. a new rule book, though. That is the rumor. All right, so let's play games where we did understand the rule book. Or, well, actually, yes. let's, let's be very clear. We should have been able to understand the rule books. We should have been. It's interesting how you put that little asterisk in there, Tom. I'm just <laughs> prepping for the assault on me by my mean co-host. Oh um, yes. So let's let's go backwards here, okay? Last last time we uh, talked about uh, in our last episode, Dale of Merchants, right? Yes, it showed up on our list of games that no one talks about. So we're going to talk about it, prove you wrong. But this is actually yes. well. I should note that I I did not even hear of Dale of Merchants one. I had you you pulled this out and went, yeah, I really enjoyed Dale of Merchants one. I'm like, what? What? I've never heard of this game, Dale of Merchants two is a little bit of a deck-building game with animal-themed cards. Right. It's essentially, it's, it's just a, a standalone expansion to the first game. Uh, there's right. six different animals in each game. You can play them by themselves, or you can mix them together. There's literally, as far as I can tell, zero rule changes. There's just six different animals. So hmm. you can mix together different, an, you know, four animals. Each animal is a type, like one of them attacks other players. Another one... Uh, is lets you do things on a future turn. Another one lets you have lots of money or whatever. And so, I love that it's the sloth deck that does things on a future turn. Well, they tried to be a bit thematic with these, and it's cute. And if there's one thing I really like about the artwork, it's I mean it, about the game is the artwork. I really like the pictures of all the different animals, and and it also, hmm. even though a lot of the game is similar to other deck builders, it felt a little bit unique because you are literally. To win the game, you have to get cards out of your deck and put them in front of you in a stack of one, then two, then three, all the way up to eight, where the numbers add up to those. And you actually right. have to get rid of cards to do that. And I kind of find that right. fascinating. Yeah, you buy these expensive cards uh, because they're they're powerful. I mean, the more expensive cards do cooler things. But then you have to get rid of those in order to reach the higher totals, To in order to, to play eight cards or eight value from one suit, you're probably going to have to spend a four or a five in order to do that. And uh, th that's a pretty cool card that you're getting rid of. It reminds me of um, uh, da -da -da Valley of the Kings, where you're also getting rid of cool cards in order to bank them and score them. So what did you think of the game? Uh, I did like it. I liked the the different flavors of, of the different animals. Um, there's, there's some interactivity depending on which deck you're talking about. Uh, I know you felt a little frustrated at times because there are cards. This is sort of a, a, a barrier that not every deck builder does. But when they do, it feels it, – you feel a little violated. Like when you can steal cards from someone else's deck, which is a little weird because if you're, you're being so careful to build a deck the way you want it to and then to have somebody just take cards away, it, it's very strange. Usually, you sometimes see people add cards, but actually having them taken from you is, is is weird. You don't see that in every game. Well, I specifically lost that particular game because of that. Mm -hmm. But that actually doesn't make me dislike the game. That makes me dislike that particular animal, and I just right. won't use them in the game. This was the like, crocodile I have, deck. 
I have Dale Merchants one, so I'll just mix the two. I have twelve different animals to pick from. Mm-hmm. There's two that are very interactive. I can use those less often. Mm-hmm. And even if I was playing with just Dale Merchants two, again, you don't need to use the crocodiles. You don't. So if you don't like the way a certain animal plays, you can just not put them in. Right. But yeah, I don't think it's fun to lose a card that you've bought. Um, it, the, the Dominion stuff that let you do that, I've always didn't like those either. I don't like stealing mm-hmm. stuff out of other people's deck. Engine building games always are a little. I always find it a little annoying when someone can mess with your engine. Right. Um, it, I did think it was it was good that about halfway through the game we house ruled that you got to see what was stolen from your deck, which I think is a little better because uh, you you were complaining that you weren't sure what was taken. You know, if I took a card from the top of your deck. It doesn't say show it to your opponent. You wouldn't know you no longer had that card until you went all the way through your deck once. Yeah, that was really annoying. I need to know what's in my deck. I'm like, I'm looking for this one. Oh, oh, it's gone. (laughs) Especially when you're trying to get combinations of cards. Like if you're, you're trying to get the seven pile taken care of and you purposefully get the four and the three of a particular suit, you're trying to get those into your hand. At least you're able to keep cards in your hand. You don't have to discard your hand. Um, so if you know you're waiting for a particular card in order to match with this other card, you can keep that first card in your hand waiting for the next one to come in. But if you if that card's been stolen, you don't know that until later. All right. Well, the next – that's that's, that's Dale of Merchants 2 we just talked about. Now we're going to talk yeah. about a, a game that, like our last episode, I think no one's going to talk about in a few years. But it does have a very unique theme, and that's Morpheus. When I say unique, it would have been unique in 2015. <laughs> but apparently there was three or four games about dreams that came out in 2016. There were a lot of dream games, yes. So in this game, Eric and I and other players are making dreams for people. We Mm -hmm. become dream weavers, and we're making nightmares. What were they like? Um, Fantasy dreams, and there was a third type of dream. Uh, Oh, visions. Visions, that's right. Yeah. Yep. And Prophecies or something. Combinations of these. So this this game kind of has like this rondelle where you move around this guy around the board, and then you take an action wherever you're at. And there's different kinds of actions you can take. You can roll some dice and do some dividing to get resources, or you can just take the action on the space. But everybody else can pay a token and also do that action if they so desire. And which we may have figured out halfway through the game, but still. Yeah, yep, yep. That does make the game very interesting, uh, knowing when to take an action. I mean, it's mostly standard fare. Get these resources, use these resources to complete dreams. That Mm -hmm. part of the game is pretty basic. Um, I mean, it's a it's an interesting theme, but the dreams don't. I think it might have been more interesting if they said, you know, st- running and running through the hallways of, ways at school in your underwear. That's a nightmare. Uh-huh. You know, just to give the the, the dream some flavor. There was some actual flavor, narrative flavor to it. Yeah, it's just a bunch of symbols. You got like a token, and you have to fulfill in order to fulfill the dreams. You have to have certain vials. I don't know what the vials are supposed to actually represent, like dream essence in three different flavors. There's there's pink, blue, and black. And what, what do we call them? We, we called them uh, sugar water was pink. That's Nightmare right. Nightmare juice was black. And uh, blue Gatorade was the blue. I don't know what they were supposed to be. I believe those were the actual terms used in the rule book. Those are the official ones? Okay, good. But you're also collecting symbols on that match these dreams and these symbols are worth points. It's, it's really a mathematical Euro style game. Mm-hmm. But I really like the aspect of taking an action and then other people can also take that action, but they can only do that so many times. Right. And I find that kind of fascinating and interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a similar mechanic to um, tiny epic galaxies where you're able to follow on somebody else's turn. But in this case, you need a specific type of token to do that. And you can see the, the, the tiles, the action tiles get shuffled every round and you can see what's coming up next and try and figure out which actions do I want to double up on in order to complete my dreams. Where, what's the most efficient way for me to, uh, to spend these? And I would often get excited about you know, doing an action, then realize, oh, no, I, I spent my follow token, and now I can't do the thing I need to do in order to complete this dream this round. Yeah, I, it's, I, 
I would I, I would not mind playing this one again. This is a solid, good game for me. It's not great. I think the theme could be stronger, but I thought that there's more there than meets the eye. Yeah, mechanically, it was it was pretty solid. I, I did enjoy it. So that's Morpheus. Now we'll jump to a game that I really thought I would like, but ended up not liking it that much, and that's Saloon Tycoon. Hmm. This game, when I first saw it, looked really neat because it has three-dimensional buildings that you build. And you're, you're basically building part of a town where you're building, trying to have the best saloon. And you're building a whole pile of other buildings. And so on your turn, your buildings will produce you some income. You then will use this income to – you then take an action, which might be getting some more money or spending money to build a building or getting supplies where you change your money into supplies, which act as pillars that you put on these buildings. And once a building is completely filled with these, these supply cubes – that building will score you points, and then you could build another another floor on top of it mm-hmm. and eventually put a roof. Your buildings can be like three stories high. So right. visually, it's pretty cool, and there's a lot of cool buildings in it. And some of the buildings, when you build them, will give you special actions. There's there's a deck of cards that you can play these cards and do actions. There are a lot of people. Some of the people are good. Some of the people are bad. They'll show up in your town. Good mm-hmm. people are worth points. Bad people are worth negative points. And also there's goals on the side of the table. If you ever accomplish one of these goals, you will take that card and score points with it. And each player has secret goals, which can score you a whole lot of points if you do whatever it says by the end of the game. Mm-hmm. Now this sounds on the surface like a pretty cool game. And it's not awful, right? I don't hate the game. But this – we run into the same problem I mentioned before where this is kind of an engine-building game. And you definitely can mess up other players, and it's not hard to mess them up. You can even mess up another player big time by accident. (laughs) Well, because essentially there's these people that are in front of each player. And some of the buildings will give you these people. And on your turn as your action, you can pay six coins to steal someone from somebody else or to give them a person that you have. So you like trying to get the bad people out of your town. Yeah. Because the bad people come with some pretty negative penalties. And you're trying to get good people in your town. Well, many of these secret objectives require you to have specific people in your town. Uh Uh-huh. So on the final turn, I can be like, I'm taking Lady Jane from Eric's town into mine because I need her to finish a goal. Well, Eric then does not score her because he no longer has her in his town. Right. And that was problematic. Also, I found it a little problematic keeping track of when all these people went to the different towns. Yeah, you got a whole array of these things, and many of the bad ones trigger when you reach certain milestones. I guess playing multiple times, you'd, you'd internalize that. But one was as soon as you build your fifth room, this bad guy shows up. Another one is as soon as you have ten gold, this bad guy shows up. Um, and, and keeping track. And then it's sort of like um, not wanting to trigger the phase shift in power grid. Everyone sort of circles around having four buildings until somebody decides to push to the fifth and take the nasty guy. Um, and then everybody else goes, oh, now I'm building my fifth because the, the nasty guy's on the board already. Um, yeah. I, I found it really frustrating to, to have built – you know, you have to spend um, all, these, all this money and resources to, to build a particular building, uh, a, a floor, and then spend the resources to complete it. And then you finally get this person into your your tableau that will hopefully score you points at the end. Somebody spends six gold and removes it from your tableau immediately. And uh, and but it, you have to have that mechanism because how would if somebody else builds the one floor that you need that character for? Uh, how do you get them into your your tableau? I guess you just end up stealing people all the time, but. I just don't like that that amount of flexibility. I also felt like the cards were not that – some cards just felt better than other cards. The cards were pretty powerful. Mm-hmm. And so you know, if I have a card that says take two actions, that's a pretty good card. That's a good card. Right, because I get to play the card as my action, but now I have two more actions. Right. Ordinarily, you only get to do one thing, and to get to do two things, that's pretty significant. There's also only one of many of the buildings. So you're like, ooh, I'm going to build that building. And then another person builds it before you. And I understand that that sort of thing happens in these style games. You're like the first person to get stuff. But the more people who play this game, the more chaotic that becomes. 
because everyone is trying to build stuff. And you're like, oh, I'll do – oh, wait. Eric took that guy. Oh, I'll, oh, Eric did that. Okay, mm-hmm. I'll do this. And I don't know. I just found it a little bit unfulfilling. I think it looks cool. I think the base system that the game is on is not bad. It just felt short to me. Hmm. When I was done, I, was, I wasn't happy, if that makes sense. Yeah. Not as unhappy as Eric was, but I wasn't happy. <laughs> I was annoyed. Yes, I mean it, it's okay. I think I, j- just like you said, Tom. I I didn't hate it, but I I didn't feel. Usually, with an engine building game, you sort of feel exhilarated, you know, when things start to click, and I just didn't feel that here. There's just too much that that was getting messed with, and uh, it was too chaotic to plan. In our last, uh, oh, so that's Saloon Tycoon. In our last episode. I mentioned that my two favorite games of the show were probably uh, Glucks and um, Vikings Gone Wild, but actually there was three. My third Mm. that I really enjoyed playing was Habitats. Ah, yes. Habitats is the new Quali game. Quali is a small publisher that makes one game a year, I think. Something like that. They usually release it at SN. They make 1,000 or 2,000 of them. And they usually have some pretty nifty components. In particular, this one has some little porcelain animals to the point where they're different in each game. Yeah, you don't know what you get till you open it up. So each player has an animal, and then there's a, a, a grid of tiles that are placed face up on the table that show different zoo animals. And on your turn, you can move your animal one space forward or one space to the left or right, although if someone's <laughs> blocking you, you can jump over them, as we learned. Yes, um, I think not the terribly rules... clear in the rule book, but yes. So you have usually three tiles. Sometimes you have fewer tiles to pick from. You pick one of these tiles, and then you add it to your zoo. Now, where you add it, it's a big deal because there are a few goals in the middle of the table. Like if maybe someone has the biggest park, they're going to get points, or you know, grasslands will get the most points, or maybe if you have a bunch of tiles in a straight line, you'll get points or whatever. So you might be trying for those goals. But each tile, many of the tiles have animals on them. Some of them have flowers and things, but many of them have animals. And these animals need to have tiles that are next to them or part of a group that's next to them before that, tile, before that animal scores you any points. So, for example, if I have a bear that shows two forest and two water on it, that means that bear tile needs to be next to a, 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 a forest tile and a water tile and either next to two forests and two water or next to a group of two forest tiles and a group of two water tiles. Right. Once you manage to put those tiles down to do that, the bear then activates, I guess. Basically, you turn them right side up so you show that you score the points on that tile. So by clever tile placement, you might activate several things at one time. And there's other things that will give you points. There's flowers that will give you points, You know, depending on how many different flowers you have. There's towers that give you points if they can see things in different directions. There's access roads where you're, they'll score your points, but you have to – cover up all the sides of them except the sides where the roads are going at because those are the exits to the zoo. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this is a tile placement game like Carcassonne style a little bit. Right. But it feels different. First of all, it feels pretty thematic, I thought. Mm -hmm. You know, like the access roads having to be on the outside of the zoo, the having animals next to the habitats that they want. I thought that was pretty cool. And it also just seemed to offer two good choices each turn. The first choice is what tile am I going to take? And then the second choice is, where am I going to put that tile in my zoo? Right. And those are two simple choices for the most part, but they offered enough meat, and the game was just long enough where I felt like it was a – this is a game that, you know, if it was more widely available, I think would really be selling like hotcakes. I really liked it. I liked the zoo theme anyway, but I was just really on board with the habitats. Yeah, I, I liked it as well. Um, it, it has – we didn't really talk about the tactical aspect of selecting these tiles because you're all in that grid with your little animals. So, you know, where you guide your animal, it's not just a decision of um, what is my choice this turn. It's what will be there on my next turn. Where am I in this grid? You don't want to get yourself into a corner because despite being able to jump over some animals, it really does limit your selections. If you get into a corner and can't sort of maneuver toward the tiles you want, if you're all alone, you have far more choices and are able to maneuver around. You, you want to sort of avoid the other animals in the grid. That is an interesting aspect as well. So there's that positional, there's the choice of what tiles you want, um, and then where you're going to put them is is another interesting selection. It. I agree. I wish this was more widely available because 
I think it's it's being sold for somewhere in the sixty dollar range, sixty to seventy even,、um, which is a little much. If it was closer to forty, I think it would be it would sell very well and and be a, an excellent choice for a family game. Yeah, well, I'm going to do what I can to get this game published on a wider distribution because I really think it fits in that 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 real sweet spot of midweight game with、mm-hmm. a fun theme. I mean, this is a game I could easily play with my wife or my family.、Uh, they would really like playing this style game. Yeah,、um, the animals are cute too. That's true. That's true. And and you know you don't know what animals you're going to get. So, well, but、uh, that 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 doesn't matter as much. But yeah, they are. You're playing little porcelain animals, and you're just moving them around the grid. And then when you're done, you look at your zoo, and you're like, ah,、oh, look at all these animals in my zoo. I got the <laughs> elephant. You know that sort of thing. Yeah. So that's cool. Habitats. And、that's the last episode you'll hear in a really long time where Eric and I have played all the games. Weird, <laughs> you know, but he, that's really strange. It's <laughs> a special bonus. We need to have more episodes. That's that's some of the some of the feedback we've been getting. People have been saying, "Well, Tom and Eric need to play more of the same game." Well, if we were in the same group, that would likely happen more often. Uh huh. Yeah, that's probably not going to happen. Well, I, I wasn't actually leading in that direction. I was just saying that's why we're not doing more of the same game. Okay, well, let's、uh, find out about a game and about if it's fun to lose or not. Hey, board gamers! BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with more Louisiana flavor. Louisiana summers are hot, way softish show, but as hot as it's been in 2016 down in the Bayou State, it was nowhere near as hot as designer Alex Fister was this year. Mr. Fister won three of the top awards in international hobby board gaming in just the last few months. Not to mention a Kenner Spiel in 2015. So, which of these games should you try next? Does your game group love Libertalia, with its juicy decisions over which cards to play to maximize your points, while bluffing the other players as to your strategy? Well, then, spice it up with Broom Service by Alexander Fister. Broom Service is a 2015 release from Alia Ravensburger. Two to five players take turns moving their witches across a beautiful landscape of towers, delivering magic potions. And dispelling angry clouds along the way, the game plays over seven rounds, and there's a unique twist in the mechanics. Players have not one, but two witch meeples to keep track of over the board. All actions in the game, including movement of the witches and delivery of the potions, are accomplished by playing a hand of four cards from the ten roll cards in your hand. Each player is given the exact same cards: a witch for moving quickly around the board, a fairy for dispelling rain clouds, gatherers for forming the potions. And druids for delivering the potions, but the real twist is that each roll has two available actions: a brave action and a cowardly action. If a player chooses the brave action on his or her turn, and no one else plays that role, the player gets the usually awesome brave reward. That could be anything from extra victory points to extra money. But if anyone else plays the brave action following the first player's choice, unfortunately, that choice is trumped, and the previous player gets nothing. Ah, but the player could choose the cowardly action, and then that rule is safe, albeit with a lesser benefit. After each player plays out all of the four rule cards in his or her hands, the next round begins. Now, I would have voted this game as the 2015's top game that underwhelms me from its description. Frankly, the box cover art, the reviews I read, and even the gameplay videos really didn't strike my fancy. Then I heard a number of podcasts extolling its virtues. And I kept hearing that there's a beauty in broom service, which comes in the bluffing and the backstabbery. When you're the first player, there is such a deep and delicious decision-making panic. After surveying the board, and the potential penalty cards, and the cards in your hand, and the towers, and the clouds in your area, making that first move is such a gut-driven decision. Are you going to go cowardly, or are you going to go brave? Are there any downsides? There's a lot going on for new hobby gamers with multiple paths to scoring points. The random round event cards are awesome, but they can sometimes add a level of chaos or change the action of the game so much that it loses a little of the theming. The plus side of having two witches and therefore two sets of actions to explore can be intimidating for younger players. But all of these are quibbles, and there is so much more on the positive side of this game. If your game group likes to play games that combine beautiful bits, a board, and cards too, a great game from one of the hottest designers around, then I've got the game for you. Head on down to your friendly local game store and pick up a copy of Broom Service. Until next time, les et les bon temps roulé.
And now it's time for bonus action. Musings, stories, gripes, and theories with Mike Rudman. So I've been around the Dice Tower long enough now that I think it's time I come clean about something. I am not very good at games. As in, if you're having a rough day at a convention and you happen to see me wandering around, invite me to join you for a game and in no time at all you'll probably feel better about yourself. I think there are a couple of reasons for this. For one thing, like a lot of game groups, mine suffers from collective acquisition disorder. We're constantly buying new games, then constantly wanting to play these new games, and rarely going back to the same game more than once. So especially with heavier Euros, I rarely spend enough time with a game to settle into any kind of decent strategy. On top of that, I often suffer from what you might consider the opposite of analysis paralysis. I get impatient and want to move things along, so I'm prone to making ill-advised moves after not considering all available information, and I make really stupid mistakes. Yes, I'm the guy who just forgets about feeding his people in Agricola. Okay, time for the harvest. Son of a... Agricola is notorious for being a miserable game when you're playing poorly. There are a lot of board games that are not friendly to you when you make mistakes like this. Age of Steam is so punishing for losers that Martin Wallace designed Steam as a kinder, gentler version of the same system. Even the recent hit Scythe, a game that I love, can cripple you early on if you make a poor decision. Which, of course, I did when I inadvertently left a big pile of resources alone and undefended. You can guess what happened next. I spent the next 45 minutes trying to recover, and it was not pretty. You'd think I'd learn from these experiences and slow down. I'm not an idiot. I should see these things coming. But I often don't. So the end result is that while I love board games, I don't win very often. When someone asks me what types of games are my favorite, I don't answer middleweight to heavy euros or thematic cooperative games. I answer games that I don't mind losing. Games that are fun from beginning to end regardless of how you're doing. This is how I felt the first time I played Dominion. I had no idea what I was doing. I was still operating under the assumption that getting a lot of free coppers was a good thing, and I got trounced. But I had so much fun. I immediately took to deck building and seeing card combos come together in new and interesting ways each time. Of course I like to win, but with Dominion it didn't really affect my enjoyment of the game. Which is a good thing, because about the only time I play Dominion these days is with my father online. At press time, my dad has logged over 12,000 games of online Dominion. Yes, 12,000. So I rarely beat him. But I still enjoy the game because there are always good options and you're never truly frustrated to the point where it isn't fun. A couple of other fun-to-lose games that come to mind are Zolkin, the Mayan Calendar, and Lagrangia, two outstanding Euros that have seemingly dropped off most people's radars. These two games may not seem to have much in common, but each presents so many options each turn that you always feel like you're making progress. You're never completely dejected because there's always an option that will advance your cause and help you feel like you're achieving something, even if you're really not. My current favorite fun-to-lose game is the exceedingly difficult cooperative card game, The Grizzled. I haven't played with the expansion yet, but we've played the base game seven or eight times without a win yet. But I love playing this game. We may never win, and I'll still want to play it, because every time we play, it feels like we could win. I feel excitement and anticipation with every card draw, and when the game ends, up to this point in defeat every time, I'm ready to play again immediately. How about you? What's your favorite game to lose? Let me know on the Dice Tower Guild. Oh, and if you ever come upon True Blue in an online Dominion room, stay away. The guy's a total ringer. Oh, and now, a tale of awkwardness. In April 2015, I bought a copy of Brass while on a trip to visit my sister. I had heard a lot about the game and was certain that my wife and the rest of my gaming group would love it. Life happened. Between work and school, the game sat on the shelf. On the few game nights we were able to make it to, it didn't get to the table. In September, my wife saw that a two-player map was available from Cool Stuff, Inc., Excited, we ordered one with the hope that having a two-player option available, we would be able to get brass to the table with just the two of us. A couple weeks later, the map arrived, and excitedly we... 
put it in the brass box and back on the shelf because life kept happening. Two months later, in early November, we finally found a few hours of time where we could finally, finally break out the game. While my wife read over the rules, I set up the two-player map. I took off the shrink wrap and began to unfold the board. Hang on, though. The board isn't the normal fold-into-quarters type board. It folds in half. Oh, wait. No, thirds? No, sixths? That's weird. Carefully, I finished unfolding the board so as to not stress the board folds unnecessarily. My wife started walking through the setup. There are some cities that aren't used, but they're on the map. Oh, no problem. I grabbed the wrong map, I think. I got the other map out of the box and unfolded it. It was exactly the same as the one I'd already laid out. Did I accidentally order a spare map instead of the two-player one? I checked the label on the shrink wrap I'd removed, and sure enough, it said two-player map. Well, shoot, we had been sent a mislabeled item. While my wife put sticky notes over the cities we wouldn't be using, I sent an email to Cool Stuff Customer Service and let them know that we had been sent the wrong item while apologizing for noticing two months late. We played brass for the first time, and we loved it. We look forward to sharing it with our gaming group. After we were done and putting the game away, I started to fold up the board. Hey, Mike, hold on a minute, my wife said as I began to fold the board. No, I've got this, I replied. It folds weird and I'm keeping the creases from tearing. No, no, look at the back of the map. I looked at the back of the map. Oh, no. The map was double-sided. Turning the map over, I saw that the two-player map was on the other side. When I was opening the map to set up, I got distracted by the unfamiliar folding, didn't realize that it was two-sided, and set up the regular map on accident. I quickly sent another email to Cool Stuff Inc., retracting my earlier email and apologizing for my mistake. My wife laughed at me. How embarrassing. Well. Dear Cool Stuff, never mind. <laughs> Sincerely, Mike. I always check the back of the board. <laughs> and now I'm like, wait a minute, let's make sure we're on the right side. Because I haven't, I don't know if I've missed the side before, but I know I've definitely set stuff up. And I was like, wait a minute. This is the five-player side, and we have three players. Mm. <laughs> Flip the board type situation. That's happening. Yeah. What's some of those games will have those really weird ones where there's um, – I'm trying to think what game did this. I know Evo did it for sure, where it has two halves of the board. And depending which number of players you're playing, those are the two halves you would use. Right. So Evo, yes. so like there would be like you'd use A and B for five players and A and C for four players and B and D, for, you know, whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, huh, well, what do you know? I thought that was a, a, a less, that was a, a more fun tale of awkwardness than our last episode. <laughs> sure. Just getting ribbed <laughs> by your wife isn't that big a deal. Uh, now, cool, ribbed by cool stuff. No, I don't know if they were. I, I <laughs> sure, I'm sure the customer service rep on that one was laughing. Probably. Hopefully they read both emails first before they processed all the paperwork. Yeah, it's true. All right, well, let's get back to Brian and see what's, what's happened in the, in the past. Welcome to Cult of the Old, where I discuss games we may have forgotten about or games that failed miserably but still had some good mechanics in them. He's Brian Counter, and everything he does is counterproductive. This week, we're going to talk about Race for the Galaxy, designed by Tom Lehman in 2007, rated rank 7.8 and 41 on Board Game Geek. Now, this is a special episode. First, I want to thank Marco Dobranek of Croatia, who won the auction item I put up for the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund, that they would get to pick the game I covered for a future segment, and this would be it. All right, so for the rest of the segment, I've got a temporary co-host here, Aaron Fish, fellow Champagne resident and friend who loves Race for the Galaxy so much. <laughs> so welcome, Aaron, and can you tell us the overall picture of Race for the Galaxy and the basics of how to play? Sure. Race for the Galaxy is a card-driven game that's in space. It's about space exploration, finding planets, exploring planets, settling them, taking them over with the military, and then building goods on those planets and selling them. And it's actually based upon Puerto Rico and was originally designed to be a follow-up to Puerto Rico, and then... And ended up 
the designer decided to change the whole theme of the game and went a different direction. It came out to be very interesting. And like Puerto Rico, the different phases that you choose each round, that you play each round, are different. You might skip phase three in a given round, and the way those phases are chosen is the players will pick which phases they want to do the most. And the player that picks that we do phase two will get a benefit when they do phase two. And then also in Race for the Galaxy, the cards that you use to settle are also used as money. So if you get a bunch of cards that are really terrible, you might be able to discard them and get, trade them for other things, but most frequently you'll just use them as money to pay for the cards you do want to use. Note that there are several expansions. We're mostly just talking about the basic game here, though. The expansions do add a lot of extra cards, which in my mind is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So my thoughts on this are, at first when I got this game, I loved this game, and over time, it just started coming down in the ratings. Now, to get the negatives out of the way, the iconography is a bit of a steep learning curve. And for me, the reason my ratings kept falling is because we'd get new players in the group all the time, and it became frustrating to have to teach people over and over and over again. There was nothing wrong with the people learning it, mind you, and there's nothing really wrong with the game. So it's not really the game's fault. It's a very well-designed game, and I like it. It's just that over time it became frustrating, and I wanted to play it less and less because it took so long to introduce the new players to all the mechanics. You really do have to play a couple of rounds to get the gist. I would disagree somewhat with how long it takes to explain to new players. I've played it um, with a number of different groups that did not include Brian. And many of the groups that I've played, we taught new players very quickly how to play. Um, the icons are something that people always like to complain about, but honestly, they help the new players figure out what's going on faster than writing lots and lots of text on the cards. The things that I like about the game are, first of all, that new players can pick it up quickly, quickly enough that they can enjoy playing their very first game of it, even if they're playing with a number of experienced players. They have a decent chance of winning, although they aren't they aren't going to know all the cards, so they won't anticipate exactly what will be played. They will have a chance of winning. However, once you start playing it a few more times and you learn the cards, a lot of the in interesting strategies um, come out. So a lot of the intricate strategies that weren't there will be become more obvious. One of the things that I've noticed is, is it's a lot like a collectible card game in that the more you play it, the more you learn how the cards work together and it becomes thrilling to, to learn those combinations. I'd agree with that. Perhaps I'm just playing with dumber people than, than you are and <laughs> I am dumber than Aaron is. That's not true. <laughs> perhaps. perhaps. <laughs> My experience was that some of the people that I was trying to teach the game to had a hard time grokking it and we'd have to look stuff up for a really long time before they got the gist of yeah. it even though at its core it is a simple game. To be fair, there are a few rules that are a little bit tricky. For example, do you get the card at the beginning of the phase or at the end of the phase? Do you get the card even if you didn't, didn't participate in the phase? One of the things that I do love about it is that it has an equal amount of strategy and tactics. You can... On pretty much every game, you have to figure out what you're trying to do with this game. Am I going to go with a production strategy? Am I going to use lots of alien cards, which are worth lots of money? Or do I want to get quick, easy things that will mount up fast and make the game escalate and quit and end early? I agree that it's a great game. Uh, what really killed this game on betraying Cult of the Old and going to court towards Cult of the New, when Roll for the Galaxy came out, I just loved it because it's so accessible. I found it easier to teach new people and new people just blended right in. I definitely like Roll for the Galaxy also. Both of them are quite good, and Race is such a good game that it will probably re be remembered for a very long time. Three, two, one, go! It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. In the last Game Tech, I talked about politics. Now this time I'd like to move to a less controversial subject, religion. Now one element that most religions share is a way of practicing willpower and personal discipline through ritual and custom. Practitioners of Lent give up doing something. On Yom Kippur, Jews are supposed to not eat or drink for 24 hours. And in Islam during Ramadan, you're not supposed to eat until after the sun sets. Now, regardless of whether or not you believe in a religion, it has scientifically been demonstrated that exercising willpower helps to strengthen it and helping us to ignore short-term temptation and focusing on long-term goals and plans. Now, in addition to these specific ritual days, religions have rules, some that seem very arbitrary and often come down to custom. These rules get codified in various ways and change and evolve over decades and centuries. Now, one of the more fascinating documents that collects these rules is the Jewish Talmud. A large part of Jewish ritual and custom actually come from the Talmud and not the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. Now, each page of the Talmud has a unique structure. In the center is a small passage from something called the Mishnah, which is an ancient commentary on the Torah written around the year 200. 
Then written in blocks in concentric circles around the Mishnah passage are various discussions from different scholars. As they spiral outwards from the center, they get later and later in time, sometimes spanning hundreds of years of commentary. And the neat thing, they are very often contradictory. One passage will say that you should say the blessing before doing something, and why, and another will say you should do the blessing after. And then another scholar chimes in with his reasoning. The later scholars even directly address personally other writers who came before them, sometimes with thinly disguised insult. One scholar writes of another, he must have been falling asleep when he wrote that. And perhaps, most unusually, there are no conclusions. There's no commentator who says, this is the way it should be done. There's often a consensus, but there are certain Jewish sects that adopt one way and others that adopt another. Now, the foundation of Jewish rules and ritual is riddled with contradiction and argument. And I love that. There are some religions that do also embrace contradiction. Zen Buddhism, for example, embraces contradiction as a path to enlightenment. And the message of the Talmud is that debate is healthy, and that even if the community decides on a particular answer, preserving the debate permanently in ink is important and valuable. Don't erase the discussion and say that this was the only possible truth. Imagine if a game rule book were like that. Imagine that there was a vague rule in the center of the page that can be interpreted in many ways, and that various players and designers argued about what the rule really was and that the debate was preserved as the rules document it would be both terrifying and awesome. I think that many of us enjoy games because of the rules, not in spite of them. We like figuring out how to best manipulate the system that the designer has recreate, created. And when we run into a situation that isn't covered by the rules, we get annoyed. We think it's a defect in the system. Sometimes it's a big deal, but most often it's not. It's like the blessing before or after debate. There isn't necessarily a right answer. There's just an answer that people have settled on. Games have those same types of rules, rules where you have to make a decision as a designer, but honestly, it doesn't really matter. For example, in the Dragon and Flagon, we had to decide what happened if someone pushed a table against a wall, but there was a chair between the table and the wall. Did the table move and destroy the chair, or did the table not move blocked by the chair? And you know what? From a gameplay standpoint, it doesn't really make a difference at all. One option doesn't make the game better than the other. But we knew that if we didn't cover that situation somewhere in the rules, that at some point somebody would run into it and want to know what happens. So we just made up a completely arbitrary ruling and put it in the back of the rules in an appendix of weird stuff that may happen. But let's say we had left out that ruling and then just stopped responding to any queries, went completely dark. I could see debates breaking out between the movers and the non-movers. I'd love to see these debates written down and collected on a page, and that is what include, is included in future editions of the game. And if the players ran into the situation, they'd have to make up their own mind about where they fall. Which, I guess, is what the forums at Board Game Geek sometimes become. A quick Google search will show some sample pages from the Talmud with their unique spiraling structure. If you've never seen them before, I suggest checking them out. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. Now, this is interesting to me. I, I, I kind of understand where Jeff is coming from here as the rules writer. Mm-hmm. But I, I will admit feeling a frustration when it seems – when you do have something like this come up and you have somebody in the group who really wants to know the answer to this question and the rules don't address it and you think this has had to have come up in playtesting. Right. I just understand that. Open-endedness is yeah. good. Except in a rule book, I want to. I want to know exactly what I want to know exactly what they're saying. Right. Yeah. I like having definitive answers, and and having a definitive answer means you have an immediate answer. It really bothers me when you know you're the first one to ask a question on the Board Game Geek forums. That doesn't help me now in in our game session. You know, to to go and say, all right, so how is this tile supposed to work? Because I, I don't understand it in this situation, and the, either no one's there or somebody responds and goes, well, I interpreted it like this. And then two other people go, no, we did it this way. And it becomes sort of a groupthink thing until the designer shows up, if they show up, to actually clarify. Yeah, but isn't it gratifying? This has happened to me for sure. Isn't it gratifying when you say, oh, right, I think that's the way it plays. And then later on, the designer says, this is the way it's played. And you're like, yeah. We got it right. Yeah, I was right. No, I, I really, I really have done that. I'm like, woohoo! <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. Well, especially if it's something like, well, if you interpret the three rules that apply here correctly, it should work like this. Because then you solve the puzzle right, and the designer goes, "Yep, that's how it's supposed to work." All right. But if you just made a thematic guess, I, I don't, I don't feel that much pride over that one. All right. Well, let's get to some questions. Mr. Vassal, Mr. Vassal, Mr. Vassal, Mr. Vassal, Mr. Vassal, Tom. Any truth to the rumor that nothing personal is just a reskin of Click Clack Lumberjack? Why are you so mean to your co-host? All right. Best food. Origins or Gen Con. And now Tom, the Dice Tower will authoritatively, have? definitely, Vassal, possibly, maybe, answer your questions. I, I, uh, Tom, uh, oh, which way to the bathroom? John says he recently started going to college again, and in that year of time off, when he was a year away from college, he discovered board gaming, and now he's playing board games. And he was playing games at his local store, but because he, geographically he was far away, he had to stop attending. So he signed up for a board game club at school. Hooray! So he said the first day went really well until someone decided to pull out their copy of Avalon. Now, John had played Avalon before, but this experience was quite unique. They'd played with each other's before, so their strategies and counter strategies were a known quantity to everyone except for John. Mm. And so he had fun, but he was confused and slightly lost the whole time. So his question is, when you're entering a new gaming group, what do you do to meet them on their level? What can you do to avoid the confusion that comes along with unexplained in-jokes and strategy that has been honed to a sharp point? All right. So before you go to this, you need to uh, ask for a dossier on every member of the group that, uh, that explains their past, where they grew up, uh, and, and, and a list. If you can make a list, you're not going to get every one, but if you can get a rough list of the in-jokes that they have and, uh, and maybe, maybe a session report or two from the past, uh, let's say, six sessions – that might help. I'm timing the amount of time Eric is wasting on this podcast. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, but really the answer, it seems to be obvious, is that you just don't, right? Yeah. You know, anytime you meet a new group of friends, they're going to have their in-jokes, they're going to have their stuff, and you just learn that as it goes. If there's strategies in a game that, that people know, and I mean, that's just something you learn about as it goes. Um, I, I think that it's the group's the – group's, needs to not impose these upon you. For example, the one I always remember is Resistance. And I remember playing Resistance for the first time with Jason, and he said something to the effect of, well, when there's these two people in this situation, this person's always supposed to vote guilty, and this person's supposed to vote innocent. That's just obvious. And I was like, well, I, I didn't know that. Hmm. You, know, you know, you play Resistance a lot with the same people, and these kind of things just come into play, but right. I did not know that. Um, and so that, th that, that sort of thing can happen, or maybe in this group it's a no-no, you know, like you're like, you put your drink on the table and everyone just looks at you. <laughs> you're like, oh, 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 we don't put drinks on the table here. Right. You know, each, each group is going to be different, but you just find those things out. So it's the job of the game group not to make it awkward. But they also, they might forget that you don't know these inside jokes. So mm -hmm. I just might be like, so why did everyone just laugh there? And then they'll explain it to you, and now you're on the inside. Right. It's going to take really, a while to acclimate. It's time. There's, there's really nothing else you can do about mm -hmm. it. Mark was recently playing Mansions of Madness at his local games club, projecting the app onto the wall. And whilst they were uncovering fake walls and secret passages hiding illegal religious worship, he realized just how appropriate, or more likely inappropriate, their venue was. They meet in England's oldest living convent one which still has a hidden chapel from when Catholicism was illegal and worship had to be done in secret. So his question is, what is the most appropriate or inappropriate venue you have played in given the game you were playing? Man, this is like a... This is like a... a, a de okay, I, I... I have an answer for the inappropriate one, but I don't want to get yelled at about this, okay? Okay, <laughs> okay. And I, I don't mean to make light of this at all, but if we're going to go by that, I'm pretty sure I played cash and guns at a school. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm very cautious these days where I pull cash and guns out for that. that yeah. Reason, actually. Yeah. I've played um, New Haven in New Haven. I know it's not very exciting. I mean, it's not like you know people play Carcassonne in the city of Carcassonne. That that's kind of I don't cool. I don't actually get like the that doesn't attract me that much. It's not like ooh we're in an airplane let's play an airplane game. Oh we're in a submarine let's play you know Red October. Right. Uh, um, I I will say I get a kick out of if we're in a city, 
And that city, like we're in pandemic, you're in one of the cities, and then that city gets overrun or something. You're like, ah, there goes Miami. Mm-hmm. We're all dead. You know. <laughs> in fact, there used to be a game, um, blah, 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 the uh, Monsters Menace, um, Monsters Menace America or something like that. And the monsters, and you were supposed to put a token on the map of where you were. Hmm. And then a monster would get an extra point if they destroyed that city. Right. I think playing Nuns in a Run in that convent would actually be pretty interesting. Yeah, and he did, did say that that's been played there as well. Right, I know. I'm saying I like that idea. I, I think that might be thematic. Like, I think it actually would be maybe cool to play a historical game, like a, a, a strong historical game. Like maybe play like a the Battle of Gettysburg at the city of Gettysburg somewhere maybe. I don't know. But I don't feel like compelled to do this sort of thing. Hmm. All right. Well, Philip says, do you know the feeling when you spent one and a half hours to create your village, build up your space empire, or expand your farm, making bear land into something useful? But right at that moment, someone says, okay, round six is up. Let's count victory points and see who's the winner. Or maybe they say, last point. I have 12. I win. Game over. But he says, do you know of where the game doesn't end when you think I've created something nice here? He, you know, oh, I made this combo. I want to see how it works next turn. But, oh, the game is over. Mm-hmm. He says he has several people in his gaming group that enjoy the theme and build up of such games, but always seem a little sad when that last round is over and everything has to go back in the box. And he says he's having a hard time explaining this and hope that we can even say what exists. I know what you're thinking here. You're thinking, oh, the game is over and, oh, man, I want it to build up a little bit more. Right. But this isn't really possible because it has to end. then the game's not over yet. The game has to end, right? I guess you could... Say the game ends, but let's play another two rounds, but then the game hasn't really ended. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of games where something will signify the game ends, and then there's a whole round for each player yet. Right. So Lahav does that, for example. When the game ends, you still all have one final turn to make. Right. There's a lot of games that, that end at a certain amount of time. I think I might recommend those instead. Not when someone reaches a goal... But, like, this game is going to be a certain number of turns. Okay. Those would probably be more your style because everyone – like, for example, Quadropolis. Everyone's going to get the same amount of turns in that mm-hmm. game. So that might be your better bet than a game that ends when someone gets to a goal. Because I definitely have felt that feeling where I'm like, oh, I can't wait to build this. And then Jason says, oh, game's over. Right. Well, I mean, you could always extend these sorts of games. Like if the trigger is uh, for Race for the Galaxy, somebody gets 12 things in their tableau, you could make it 14. And and then that will make it go a little longer. You're, you're obviously going to go beyond what the designer was intending as far as the length of the game. But if you really are having so much fun building your machine and you want some more time to do that, you could simply extend what triggers the end of the game. Um, looking at it in a different way, if you want to... Save some of what you built. I was thinking of the uh, the Agricola solo sequence where you play through the game and then if you're successful reaching, what is it, like 50 points, then you when you play again, you get to keep one of the things you built and start with that for the next sequence. But now you have to earn 53 points. And you have to get a better score getting the head start that you built. So you get to sort of build up over time. Yeah, I got this engine going, and I really like this card, so now I get to start with it. I'm not quite sure what Philip's aiming for. Yeah, but I, 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 know, what he's, I know the feeling he's talking oh, about. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Zach asks, What help is it to demand that publishers, designers, make a negotiation or hidden movement game with a single-player variant? The games in question are Fury of Dracula 3rd Edition and New Angeles, the new Netrunner board game. I recently observed very demanding people on forums about this subject. I do understand that we operate on a buyer's market and that if you have an agenda, you have a goal in furthering it. However, when you demand a product to be something it isn't or demand a feature that is considered by most to be a luxury addition on a game that it would be ever difficult to develop it for... You are neither helping your position or the market. Furthermore, stating that you'll flat-out refuse to purchase the game because it lacks a feature it was never designed to have is a pointless endeavor. You were not going to buy it to begin with. It seems to be a niche section of a niche market, making demands that will fall on deaf ears. 
Well, this happens a lot. I, I think I agree. No, th- uh, no, I, I really agree here, okay? I see this happen a lot on the internet. Someone will make a game, and it will be like three to five players. Someone's like, what? There's no two-player variant. Come on, there's a two-player variant. Mm-hmm. I understand that, but I don't feel like we should get all upset about these things because there's two-player games out there. Right. Oh, there's no solo play variant. Well, that's, you know, I understand that. But sometimes these games just don't work with certain numbers of players. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I designed Nothing Personal, it, you know, we made it three to five, I think. And and I I was like, wow, two players? This game just isn't meant for two players. Mm-hmm. And I figured, well, okay, well, if someone wants to make it a two-player game, they'll make a, a variant on the forums or whatever. But it's just not meant for two players. So you could have screamed at me, well, you'll lose customers if it's not two players. You're right. We will lose customers because it's not two players. But it, it just couldn't be two players. That's just not the way the game was meant to be. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it, there are just sometimes, and I and it, this happens a lot. And sometimes I might even agree with a person, say, "Why, why aren't they doing that? It seems like it's a weird thing." But it's not like the companies are being jerks. And you got to remember, we're, we're 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 coming down to a very demanding society these days, where a lot of people on the internet demand this game should be this way. Hmm. And I'm not so sure that we can always do that. Yes, it's a buyer's market, but your personal needs for a game do not should not are not better than everyone else's. And people are going to want different things. And this is why we end up with games where it will say two to seven players mm-hmm. when they really should have put three to five. Right. Like you open up the game and you're like, wait a minute, you can't even play as with two players. And at the back, they're like, okay, here's how you play with two players. You need, you know, you know, you know, you need three dummy players and you need to, you know, <laughs> take 16 five cards out of the game. Mm-hmm. Like, what? All that work? Well, yeah. And then when you play it with seven players, you find that the game that normally takes 60 minutes now takes three hours. Right. And that's because people demand all that. But I think that we should be a little careful about demanding it. At the same time, we're just kind of shouting into the wind to tell these people to stop complaining because I don't think it's anything's going to change. Mm-hmm. So, Arnold says, nowadays games come with really nice plastic miniatures, but they're often not painted. An exception is the game X-Wing, which has repainted miniatures. I think he meant pre-painted miniatures, not painted I'm again. I think so too. Okay. Anyway, it makes the game very attractive to buy hero clicks. And so, and company is another example. When do you think pre painted miniatures like humans and monsters will be standard or at least an option? I'm going to kind of spoil your mood there, Arnold. I'm going to think we're going to see less and less pre painted miniatures. Hmm. And I'll tell you why because painting miniatures is a highly skilled job. Yes. And you can get people to paint your miniatures by outsourcing it to cheap labor, which is definitely where it's happening right now with Fantasy Flight is definitely outsourcing these probably to China to get these things painted. As that market gets more expensive, which it is, okay, uh, that means those painted miniatures are going to become less cost effective for companies to do. Uh, I, it's very few games I can think of with pre-painted miniatures that there are some that have like five or six miniatures and that's fine. It's easier to do pre-painted for those. But with you have a lot of miniatures, that's an expensive proposition. Mm. Do you know what I think we'll see Eric before pre-painted miniatures? I think we'll see multi, um, plastic molds. Oh, like different colors of plastic all in the same thing. Yeah. I think we'll see that before we see more pre-painted miniatures. Hmm. We're already seeing some pretty nifty stuff being done with 3D printers. Yep. And I think we'll see more of that done in the future with bigger bigger uh, production printers that, that will come out. I don't know. I might be wrong there, but I really don't think we're going to see an influx of uh, painted miniatures. It's just too hard to do. Uh, and, and honestly, those uh, X-Wing miniatures, those are pretty expensive. Yeah, they are. Y- you're paying like $13 for a single miniature. Uh, and the Hero Clicks miniatures, they're, they're, they're cheaper, but, uh, you're not really getting great painting there. I can paint better than those, and I'm a horrible painter. <laughs> yeah, you do get some pretty sloppy paint jobs sometimes with these pre-painted. You know, if you're, I'm, if I'm you're sh- a hobbyist that enjoys painting them, you might be offended by getting <laughs> pre-painted minis. I guess you could strip them right off the bat. I'm looking at my collection right now trying to find which games I have that have pre-painted miniatures. Ah, uh, my shadows over Camelot. I bought those separately. Mm-hmm. Um, Crossmaster had pre-painted miniatures. They do, but those aren't cheap. No, 
Uh, Zaya has uh, pre-painted miniatures. Yes, that's also an, an exception. Usually you don't see pre-painted ships. It does make it an excellent pickup and delivery game. The best I've ever played of that type. Really? You're just gonna <laughs> just gonna dig that. Okay, one in let's there? continue on. <laughs> What's the next question? Chad has a question about availability of games and how fast some can go out of print. Three of his top games that he's put on his Christmas list for this year are Voyages of Marco Polo, Saint Petersburg Second Edition, and the expansion for Bruges. All of these, however, are from Z-Man Games, which was acquired from Asmodee. None of these are more than two years old, yet all of them are out of print. I was especially surprised with Marco Polo, as this was a 2015 Kennerspiel des Jahres nominee. Are the print runs that small for these games, or is the lack of availability due to the Asmodee acquisition? What factors do companies consider when deciding whether or not to do another print run? Well... What factors do companies put in? Will people buy the game or not? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's really all there is to it. Uh, as for your question of, is it are the print runs really that small, or is the lack of ability due to Asmodee acquisition? I'm going to go with yes to that one. Mm-hmm. Yes, the print runs are that small, and yes, that probably has something to do with the Asmodee acquisition. Asmodee is apparently seemingly honing down the number of lines in their North American market, at least. Yeah. So if a game doesn't sell well, boom, it's gone. Fantasy Flight has done that for years. If a game doesn't sell well, boom, it went off at their Christmas sale. Yeah. And then they then they print other things. Uh, so Marco Polo may have won the Kenner Spiel. The Kenner Spiel is not nearly as big as the Spiel des Jahres. It just isn't. And also the Kenner Spiel is effective in Germany, where Marco Polo is still in print. It doesn't affect the American market as much. Mm. Now, I think Marco Polo is a fantastic game. I really like it. Still my collection. All my it's mine is blinged out too. I got all kinds of cool pieces in it that are there from uh the Stonemeyer treasure chests. Hmm. Which incidentally, Eric, I just got the three newest ones today. Really? The Gadget Guide, the Terror Tome, and the Adventure Atlas. Wow. The coolest one I think is in the Terror Tome and has these little metal magnifying glasses. Hmm. That you can use for clues in the various Arkham Horror games. It actually has hearts in this game. If you know the use for health, except these hearts look like um, hearts. Oh, <laughs> like anatomical hearts. So that this is really the Arkham Horror box. <laughs> yes, it really is. <laughs> anyway, um, so games are going to go out of print. They just are. Companies print very small print runs. People think that companies print more games than they do. Mm -hmm. A company, if you print 5,000, that's a pretty successful game. 10,000 is a very successful game. 50,000 is unbelievably successful. And, you know, to go beyond that, you have a bona fide hit on your hand. Right. But look at a Kickstarter game. If a, if a Kickstarter gets 3,000 backers, we think that's phenomenal. That's 3,000 games. Mm-hmm. They will probably print double that to sell the people after the Kickstarter. That's 6,000. That's not a huge number. Yeah. And with the market always being buy the new stuff, buy the new stuff, buy the new stuff, it's hard to sell older games. It, it is frustrating, though, that things go out of print so quickly. Um, just because, it, you know, you hear about something, you, you know, not everyone hears about it the immediate moment it comes out and, and to then track down some of these releases. Um, it is a shame that some of these that maybe would have been reprinted before the Asmodee acquisition are, you know, being more clinically evaluated. And, uh, you know, if they're not top performers, aren't being reprinted as quickly. Yep, that's really the truth of it. Uh, it's just going to be that way. Hmm. Oh, well. Matt says, this is kind of the opposite here of a previous question. Do you think board game enthusiasts have become too obsessed with component quality? Hmm. It seems many have stopped seeing nicer components as an experience enhancer and now see them as a baseline requirement for enjoying a game. For example, when the latest edition of Splendor came out, there were quite a few furious posts about the reduced weight of the poker chips. With some even saying things like, that was the whole reason I enjoyed the game. Hmm. Many of your own contributors on the Dice Tower named these old chips the Component of the Year a few years back, which is also interesting. I agree. It was not Component of the Year. Those people were wrong. <laughs> anyway, I even caught myself comp contemplating a return of a recently purchased copy of Raw 
because I desired the wooden sun tokens and raw figure of past editions. Then I came to my senses and realized I have this game here now in front of me. Play it and be happy. I'm not advocating for garbage components. I'm just wondering if too many board gamers are letting component quality dictate their enjoyment of games nowadays. This is going to be kind of – this is obviously a very subjective thing, right? You can sit there and go, wow, you don't need stuff to be that nice. And someone else will say, well, I'm happy with paper. Yeah. And someone else wants – I mean every everyone's going to draw the line at different places. I personally prefer a higher component quality than Eric does, I think, for the most part. Yeah, it factors more into your decision on liking a game. I, I'm willing to – like say you know victory point games, I'm willing to play with the paper mats and uh, you know rougher tokens for those games because I enjoy some of the mechanisms that uh, that come into play. Um, and but, that really makes me angry. Yeah, not angry, angry, but you know I just I have a lower tolerance than Eric. Right. I mean, the, the, you there's a certain baseline that you absolutely need. You have to have some durability. You have to have clarity of components. Sometimes if you go too cheap. You end up with with stuff that doesn't work the way it's supposed to, um, but yeah, it's all it's a personal preference thing. But certainly, the baseline of a major publisher producing a game, there is a certain level of component quality that is expected, and if you go below that, people are going to balk. Especially, I do find it annoying when a first edition of a game has a certain level. Uh, and then they reduce that level for a new printing. <clears throat> That's bro. It's annoying. And then you you sort of look over the table at, at you know well their edition of Acquire was pretty awesome. Why can't I get that? Well, yeah, but there's also the reverse where sometimes the second edition is so much better than the first. Very true. So it evens out, I guess. But in other words, Matt, I think it's just that people are different than you. Like you probably would think I'm crazy because I. Like I was just talking about these these component upgrades from Stonemaier games, and I'm super pumped about them. <laughs> Z was kind of rolling his eyes at me, and I'm like, oh, what can I put this in? What can I put game can I put this in? Right. Because I love my games to be gorgeous, and that really does affect my enjoyment of the game. I, I, don't, I don't know how else to explain it. I really like having 3D components on the table. Right. Having miniatures is so much cooler than stand-ups. Having a three-dimensional heart is cooler than a little heart disc for me. It just the if the whole game just looks like a big toy set, that's cool for me. <laughs> However, even though I give people grief about games and 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 the opposite, right? Like I'll, I'll make fun of like, can't believe you like a game that just has a bunch of tokens. I'm really I really don't look down on people who like that sort of thing. If if that's what you like, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, you don't. If if component quality doesn't matter to you, that's fine. But but let me enjoy my toys. Okay. All right. One last question here. Bree and Josh want to know about our feelings on board game subscriptions like Battle Bin or Play Crate. Do you think it's worth it, or is it better to save the money and use it to buy a game that you want? I'm asking because I don't have many games yet, and I'm not sure what I like yet, so I'm looking to be exposed to a lot of themes and mechanics to see what I like. There are game stores that are in my area, but they don't have playtimes that I can get to, and they seem to be a somewhat closed group. I haven't subscribed to any of these. Have you uh, taken a look at any, Tom? I have. Um, I'm really kind of a mixed mind about these, because I think it all depends what you're looking for. I would never do one. Why? Because I want to pick the games I get. Mm -hmm. I don't like having a random game sent to me. I already have that sent to me now as a reviewer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. I want to pick the games that I play. So for me, I think it's a better deal. However, I do subscribe to a sock service that sends me a random pair of socks each month. I don't care about which socks. I just want funny, cool, weird socks with weird things on them. Mm -hmm. So I'm perfectly content with that, and it's actually fun to open the box and see what socks I got that month. Right. So if you feel that way perhaps about games, then this is definitely worth it because it's a cool surprise. You don't have to put effort into figuring out what game you want. You just get the box, and there's the game. Right. And usually they'll have some other things in them. Maybe they'll have some like game bits and stuff. I have yet to see one of these boxes that has truly spectacular stuff in it, but they usually have decent games in them. Right. So it all depends on your atmosphere, on your attitude on this. 
Uh, but for me and my house, I want to pick my games. It does sound like for Bree and Josh here that, that they are a pretty good candidate for this. Uh, you know, not having a large collection. I I would always be worried that like, am I, am I going get, to get a bunch of games I already have, or ones that I'm not interested in because I already know what I what I'm looking for, or ones I was gonna order anyway. I don't know. It seems it seems a little weird. Uh, I know there's one that you tell them what your collection looks like, and they will send you a game you don't own. Um, but it seems like Bree and Josh here are a good candidate. You know, if you're trying to explore different types of games, this would be a good way to do it. Yeah, my only my only concern about this is that I know that these guys are going to go to companies and say, we want to get a lot of games for cheap price, and these companies are going to dump on them games that are not selling that well. Sure. Or, or that is ones going that they to want to promote a lot. Yes, but historically, for me, looking at them, yeah. it's games the companies are trying to promote, or that they just, you know, if a company's trying to promote a game, it's not selling that well to begin with. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, let's find out about Zulkin. Let's get under the hood and see what makes one of our favorite games tick with a board game biopsy. Hi. Today I would like to take you into a look of Zolkin, the Mayan calendar, designed by Daniele Tascini and Simone Luciani for Czech Game Edition. In the last episode, we talked diffusely about worker placement in general and mentioned how this can be twisted by the interaction with other mechanisms. The main subject of my everyday job is time, a topic I am fascinated with and I find integration of time in board games to be one of the most interesting facets of our hobby. That's why Tzolkin is certainly amongst my favorite heroes with a few others. Tzolkin does an excellent job in recreating the cycle of seasons and in manifesting the tension between the immediate needs of a city and the long-term goals of the civilization that inhabits it. It manifests time in a game in a way that no other game that I know of does. For those unfamiliar with Tolkien, its most distinguished feature is a set of interlocking wheels that synchronously spin once every player has taken their turn. On their turn, players can place workers on the wheels by paying corn, the currency of the game, depending on how many workers they are placing and on what spaces are available. Workers must occupy the lowest, cheapest space available every time. Alternatively, players can remove some or all of their workers and only then receive the fruit of the action. You cannot place and remove in the same turn. Leaving workers on the wheel longer will yield more fruit, yet it can interfere with the progression of your plans, especially since you need to get ready for feeding rounds that will hit you at regular intervals. What I love about Solkin is how its potential strategies are as interlocked as its wheels. You gather corn and resources to build buildings and move on temple uh, scoring tracks of sort, but in turn buildings can move you up on the tracks as well and the tracks can give you back resources. All of this intertwines with you offering crystal skulls to the gods, which can give you resources and move you on the temple tracks. Temples, buildings and offerings all give you points, but the interaction between the three is tense and it all rotates around, no pun intended, this ingenious system of worker placement and worker maturation on the spinning wheels. Time, as I said, it's one of my favorite elements in games, and it enables an endless source of interesting gaming discussions. Tolkien in particular always provides a memorable experience in terms of when could I have done something, as opposed to simply what could I have done differently. What are your favorite games where time is a transparent factor? And by transparent, I mean not simply the succession of turns. Let me know in the forums and see you, uh, well, next time. Now it's time to aim for the sweet spot with Glenn Flaherty. 
Hi everyone, this is Glenn Flaherty from The Sweet Spot, and today I want to talk to you about uh, the solo, the solo variant of Castles of Burgundy card game. That alone, why it's going to make you want the game. Also, Chrononauts Back to the Future. Okay, so the Castles of Burgundy, the card game, how does it play? You have dice cards. Dice cards you use to buy resources. Resources you try to convert into points by having triplets. You can also hit milestone markers along the game. Um, you get bonuses. There's many paths to victory. It's a very logical game. The only downside to that one is uh, does it have anything to do with castles? No. Does it have anything to do with Burgundy France? Absolutely not. But it's still a very engaging game. It's also a table hog, but I can deal with that. The best part about this for me, though, is that it has a solo variant. And, you know, in my life, uh, going to game groups is the least often. Often I will uh, have close friends where I play with my wife, and anything that can give me a solo variant adds that much more value, and this value is off the chart. It is so incredibly good. Moreover, the AI player for Castles in Burgundy is so simple. Oh my goodness, wonderful. You know, so many times um, you will play a game, and the AI instructions are so overwrought that it you might as well just play as two different people at the table, okay? But in this game, the AI player literally is just a little stack of cards, and you flip it over. It can't get any more simple than that. Absolutely fantastic. No one will be disappointed by buying this game. The, the, the value for the dollar is off the charts. Now, Chrononauts, back to the future. Um, I investigated this one because I know there's a new Back to the Future game, and uh, Chrononauts essentially, uh, you know, by Looney Labs, was a time game that came out earlier. And Looney Lab actually ha has a patent on how to play this game, which is to say there's a timeline of events, and you're trying to get certain things to trigger. So you kind of have to manipulate the timeline, move things around, this, that, and the other. It is a very neat idea. Um, it's too chaotic with multiple players, so it really should just be a solo experience. The box art looks really, really cool. The cards, abysmal. They really need to get the uh, graphic design pumped up. But the concept is neat. Um, I, I, I don't know how often it would hit the table for you. I think it was worth something to look at just to check out that mechanism. Um, but... Um, I, I thought it was better than the new Back to the Future game. So anyway, okay. So, the solo Castles of Burgundy card game, fantastic. Even if it's multiplayer, fantastic. It, it is a, a no-brainer. you got to get that game. Chrononauts, definitely try it out. I think there's something worth exploring there, even if you don't buy yourself. Okay, guys, thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Uh, interesting that, that Glenn is mentioning the Castles of Burgundy card game. I, I won a copy of this at BGGCon and, and played through the, the two-player game and, and really enjoyed it. I, I think this is a, it's a solid game, but uh, hearing how easy the solo game is has me wanting to explain it. In fact, uh, the gentleman I was playing with uh, in the two-player game said he usually plays it solo. Um, and, and so it's, it's neat to hear that that's a, that's a viable option on that game. It uh, increases the value of it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I haven't played this one solo. I really like the game, but I, I'm curious. Huh. Yeah, I did used to play Chrononauts, not the Back to the Future one, but I, I used to play standard Chrononauts solo in my early days of playing that one, too. Man, the only people, you know, sometimes you got to play a game solo because no one else will play it with you. Hmm. It's time for the Dice Towers Question of the Week, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., in which our team of gaming experts answers one of your questions, thus increasing the odds that someone will get it right. This week's question, how do you get someone to play a game that only you want to play? Hi, everyone. It's Glenn from The Sweet Spot, and simple enough, don't be that guy. I've rarely seen a game night where uh, somebody has successfully convinced people to play, and if they end up doing it, it's because they were badgered. They're playing half-hearted, checking their cell phone, and they're just waiting to play the game they really want to play. So it's a social event. Uh, go with the flow and have a good time, man, regardless of what it is. Don't, don't waste your energy trying to convince people. This is Professor Scott Rogers of Biography of a Board Game. And how do I get my friends to play a game that only I want to play? 
I have a dedicated game night. I say, uh, tonight we're going to be playing Imperial Assault, and anyone who wants to come and play that game, they're welcome to join us. And if you want to play something else other than Imperial Assault, like X-Wing or Rebellion or something like that, we're, we're just not playing that tonight. We'll just we'll have to schedule that for another time. So I just pick a game, I invite people over, tell them that's the game we're going to play, and if they don't want to play, then that's fine, we'll see them the next time. Hello, Jack here, and the answer is, I usually don't. I'm a firm believer that people should only play games that they like, and that's very important to me because I tend to dislike so many games, and so I don't want to pass this idea that you must play games you will finally find something that everybody at the table likes. I'm positive about that. Everyone has a good enough collection today that you will find something that everybody likes. So, no, there is no way and there shouldn't be a way to make people play a game that they don't want. Thank you and have fun. Hey, this is Paul Owen of Dice Tower News. Getting the group or the family to play the game that only I want to play usually involves a negotiation. I'll play yours and then you play mine. With the family, it could be part of a plan for how we're going to spend the day. Let's play this game, mom will make popcorn and smoothies, and then afterward I'll take you to laser tag. Something like that. But to be honest, some games I just have to give up on until the next convention to find somebody to play them. And that's okay, too. Hey, Tony and Marty, rolling dice and taking names. All you got to do is set up a game, and people will play it if you want to play it. Setup is always the killer, so that's how I get people to play the game that I want to play. Marty? Oh, it's easy for my friends. I just say, hey, guys, we got a new game we need to review. You want to play? It's Roy Candy from Epic Gaming Night, and I normally don't have too much of an issue with this, but if there's a specific game that doesn't work really well with my normal game group, I'll try to create a separate event and invite people over that would specifically enjoy playing that game with me. A lot of times I have to do this for some of the longer more epic games that don't normally fit into the regular game night and we don't really have time for or some of the people there just aren't interested in things that heavy i look to invite people i know will specifically want to play the games that are hard for me to get played all righty i like the idea of creating a separate event to play that particular game it, of course that's actually a really good idea it's your best right. bet. It probably is the most viable option. Uh, what I had said, uh, I'm agreeing with Paul uh, in, in negotiating, uh, essentially, and this is sort of the, the theory behind the pick list that we use in our group. Um, if you play my game, I am volunteering to play your game down the line and, and vice versa. Uh, it's sort of that social contract of saying, well, look, you know, we all want to play our games and we need people to play them, so we take turns uh, playing those games. Um, at some point, it could break down if there is a game that everybody dislikes. Um, it's one thing to set up something that people haven't tried, but if everyone has played it and doesn't like it, and you're the only one that does like it, it's hard to convince people to play games that they hate. I can convince somebody to try something that they aren't sure they're going to like. But if they already dislike it, it's it's a lot harder sell. Like somebody trying to convince me to play Taj Mahal or something, I'm going to resist pretty heavily. I will always try and find out what's the other game. If somebody picks Taj Mahal, I'm going to say, well, what's the other one? I'm probably going to sit on that one. Um, but occasion- yeah, but that, that seems weird to me, though, that you would actually play a game you don't like. See, I would just flat out refuse it. Well, I mean, I, I like hanging out with my friends. Yeah, but I can sit there and watch them play the game. I guess. I mean, I, I, maybe I will find something about the game that I enjoy more than I remember. I just feel like life is too short to play games I don't like. There's so many games out there. I'll play games that I'm not super fond of, but if I dislike a game, no way. So there's only uh -huh. one game being played, and it's one... So it, for me, Taj Mahal is the only game. We're down to four or five players, and the person's pick is Taj, and I either play it, or I go home. That's where you go, oh, I'm getting pretty tired, guys. I guess. Got to get out of I don't know. I'm, I mean, that's a that's a very unique situation. Or not a very unique. I guess it happens to some people. But in my gaming group, that's usually never a problem. Right. There's always, There's always some, at least something else one game that I'd be interested in. And usually it's the one I pulled out. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm just going to sit there and read the rules, I might sit there and read the rules to a game and kind of chat with the people playing the game that I do not like. That's true. But I, I can still spend time with them. I just... I really, you could convince me to play a game that I'm not a big fan of, maybe, that mm -hmm. like, ah, game's okay, but if I dislike a game, I'm just not going to do it. 
Maybe if it's your birthday and you're like, <laughs> my one birthday wish, Tom, is that you play this game with me. <laughs> okay. But I will not play a game I don't like to get people to play a game I do. I will play a game that you like a lot that I like okay to – you know, I'll, I'll do that sort of bartering. It's a gradient. Yeah. But, I, but I, I'm you not are, it is tough if, no, if everyone hates the game you want to play. That's different from people not really, you know, being as gung ho about it as you are. They'll still probably play it if it's if it's the option that night. Well, what I recommend in that situation is to get married. Oh, have children. <laughs> raise those children to like that game and then play it with them. No, but really there are some games like <laughs> Dual Vages. I don't really know many people who want to play that with me. But Melody will. Hooray! Yeah. I don't need those other people anymore. <laughs> um So but but I have you know, there's some games I have that not many people like to play. Well, I'll then say I'll play it at a convention or I'll play it. You know, I'll hold an event. There's somebody. Now, mm-hmm. I'm very fortunate because in my play group is a man named Jason Levine. He will pretty much play anything. Mm-hmm. So I'm cool. But I, I would rather than – I mean, I really don't think you should force people to play a game and really browbeat them. Please play this game. But uh, there's so many different variations on this thing. You might be in a group that plays the same game all the time. And then I would say they really probably should try to play other stuff. But – if they don't want to play your game, making them play it isn't going to make it fun at all. Yeah. That's an interesting question. I'd love to get everyone's feedback on that one. That's a great forum thread, I believe. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that seems to be it for another episode. I'm pretty excited, Eric. We are, like, as of you folks listening to this, we are a day away from cruising it up. Oh, boy. I'm I'm excited. I'm excited. Is this your first cruise? My first time on a big boat, yeah. It's bigger than a Titanic, actually. Is it's it? It's always kind of a weird thing. That's, yeah. That's weird. No no, no icebergs where we're going. Um, but there might be pirates. That'd be exciting. Oh, okay. Anyhow. Yeah. Well, there's gonna be, we'll, we'll tell you all about it, folks. This is kind of an inaugural thing for us. So we'll tell you how it went after the fact. It's hard to say, well, this is going to be there when we're still kind of working out those details. Mm-hmm. But this is kind of our trial run. We have already made plans to do one next year in 2017. So if you miss this, and we have more rooms for 2017. So, and it's, I'm not going to give out any more details because I don't think the contract's signed yet. So let's <laughs> wait till that's completely finished before i give out the details but we will announce them and we will have probably a reduced price for people who do it earlier i cool. think maybe something along those lines anyhow that's it uh don't forget to go on our website i i, I always push people to vote on our top lists but i really want to push you guys to vote on our top 10 games of 2016 mm. because that's really interesting we like to get that data to find out what people's favorite games are and those episodes aren't too far away where Eric and I talk about our favorite games and our least favorite oh, games. Oh, boy. That, I'm pretty sure my least favorite game is already set in stone. But oh, good. Uh, my, my 10 is still – I think my 10 is set now. But you never know. It might fluctuate. I There's haven't a lot of games thought about it yet. Year. I think about this on a daily basis. I know you do. That's good. I do top 10 lists. Eric has just dropped down on my top 10 list of co-hosts. <laughs> he went from position one to one. Oh, wait. <laughs> well, we recorded this, folks, super early, comparatively to when you're hearing this. So I still haven't eaten my Thanksgiving turkey, and I can't wait, and I need to go to bed because I need to get up early and cook all morning. Indeed. And I'm super excited about that. So until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 485, was recorded on November 23rd, 2016. Coming up next week, we're on a boat! Hear our show recorded in front of our first floating audience. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me, with assistance from Jason Thompson, Itai Perez, Eric Matthews, and Rob Siri. Paddles, to be used exclusively in flooded, open pit mines, are provided by Quarriors. 
Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including Boards and Swords, Flip the Table, On Board Games, The Party Gamecast, Board Games Insider, and Board Game Blender. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. Every time I step out of the booth to save my file, Tom, I smell the cooking. My wife is making pies, and it's really, it, it's very distracting. I can understand that. This is why I didn't, we're not baking pies. I went out and bought six different kinds of key lime pie. So, wait, All amazing flavors. Six different kinds of key lime pie. All right, we got key lime pie. We have tamarind key lime pie, which if you never have tamarind, it's a great fruit. We have guanabana key lime pie, which is also another great fruit you probably never had. We have mango key lime pie. What? We have passion fruit key lime pie. And then we have white raspberry, white chocolate raspberry key lime pie. Oh, and also classic, classic key lime pie. What time is dinner? I'm hopping on a plane. Yeah, you think so. That pie's gone tomorrow. All right. I'll be there early. Why are we talking? Let's go eat.